Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. First off, I hope everyone is healthy and safe. And before we get into episode one today, I want to tell you about what we're doing over the next several weeks. I conducted an interview with two coaches who are blazing a new path to coaching teams in any sport. By utilizing an athlete-centered approach, or even better, a needs-based approach, they discovered you can actually get better buy-in and empower the players to hold themselves and each other accountable. So, treat this like a podcast and fire it up in your car, or while you're shooting around or cleaning up the garage, and really try to absorb what they're saying. I guarantee you it works, and best of all, after the fourth episode drops on May 7th, I'll host a live Q&A with Mark and Alan so we can help explain this even further. So, without any further ado, here is episode one. Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here, and I am so excited to bring to you an amazing conversation that we're going to have about coaching. And I can't think of two better people to bring in to discuss this than Alan Keane, who is the Great Britain national team under-20s head coach. He's also a coach of professional men's team in the UK, and he's an academy head coach to develop top-end talent from ages 16 to 19. And then we also have joining us Mark Bennett, who is the creator of the Performance Development Systems, which he's developed over 30 years and is also an ex-British commando who served operationally in the first Gulf conflict. But also, he is a coaching consultant and mentor for grassroots sports all the way up to professional and international teams globally. So these guys have all the experience you can imagine to delve into coaching and how it, we can improve uh, and get better at communication, motivation, and all those things. So, guys, welcome to the uh, conversation. Uh, let's discuss this. Let's discuss really what it means to have an athlete-centered approach, which is sort of the thing that you guys have really tried to create uh, around the, the globe and to help people understand and why that actually might be a, a tough term for coaches to wrap their heads around. Yeah, well, thanks, Nick, for having us on. Um, and yeah, Alan and I, I've been mentoring Alan. We've been working together for nine years now, I think, Alan, isn't it? Um, I so. And the, the development over 30 years when I first started, I didn't, athlete-centered wasn't the words around, but I wanted, I wanted athletes and soldiers to start thinking for themselves more, making good decisions based on what they saw and being able to evaluate them live and, and have that interaction of accepting feedback. So it took a long time to nail that. And as I've gone, I've had great success in mo many different sports, different age groups. But recently, there's been a fashion where this athlete centered has popped up. And I think it's just been destroyed. Um, there's so many people that think it's about just asking questions and being a nice, soft coach and, you know, never being direct to players and I think that's wrong. I mean, athlete centered is now, um, Alan, we had a chat a while ago and we don't like using athlete centered anymore because it's been discredited. Um, and looking at some of the people that say they do it quite rightly, because that's not how I would perceive athlete centered. Getting them to understand is the toughest way to coach and the toughest experience for a player in any sport is the right type of athlete centered because they can't daydream and cruise for a session. They have to hold themselves accountable and the teammates about the decisions they make and how they evaluate them live to make decisions. They have to go away and do their learning. So actually, it's not the soft approach. It's the tough approach. Um, and I can understand why a lot of experienced coaches are really put off by it because people really don't understand what it is. How many coaches that are listening to this in any sport when they bring their players in to have a chat, you get the same one or two players always talking. You get the same players saying actually nothing. And it's like drawing blood. And almost coach, some coaches end up, well, I need to tell them because, Mark, if, if I said, right, review that, tell me the choices, tell me what you need to change, the players just look at me. So they can't do it, and therefore they dismiss this approach. But actually, players need to understand and buy into it. They need to give them the tools to know how to self-review. We need to set up frameworks in practice to get them and force them to go, I'm not going to tell you the answer anymore. You're going to have to come up with it yourself, but I don't want you to stand and tell me the answer. I want you to show me the answer live. So if something's not working, I want you to make a choice to adapt it and then review with me why you made those choices. That's how we're going to grow. Yeah, for me, it was very much around, um, you know, the, the, the work you did with me, Mark, which raised my awareness of how effective I was as a coach not for just the team, but for the individuals within the team. And, you know, when you, when you share those principles and concepts and, 
I guess you don't know what you know at the time and you try to run with it. You're very often going to get it wrong originally or initially, and you're not going to do it as well as if you had experience doing it. But as time went on for me and I became more experienced with it, I began to realize I can't wear the same, I can't put the same hat on every player on the team I coach. Because as, as humans, they're all very different in their own way. And my ability to connect with them, my approach to connect with them needed to be different. And then to get the best out of them and take them or guide them, really, I want to use the word guide more than take, guide them to a, a level and a stage they'd never been to before, I discovered I needed to do it, the same concept, the same principle, but I'm, I needed to make tweaks in how I did it because um, they were all at different stages of their journey. So based on that fact and based on what other coaches were saying to me, um, I speak to a lot of coaches and many of them prophesize that they do live by an athlete-centered approach. And when we unpick their thoughts about that, or I observe them coaching, it's not in line with how I see athlete-centered approach. It's not in line with what the academics say about it. And I'm quite well-versed, if I can say that, about what the academics say, because I'm currently finishing a PhD in coaching, having done a master's where athlete-centered was at the core and the center of it. Um, so I was saying to Mark, it's a little bit frustrating on one hand because if what coach A is doing and prophesizing it's athlete-centered and I'm prophesizing I'm an athlete-centered coach, there's a massive disparity between what I was doing and what I'm doing and what I saw another coach do. So I said to Mark, we, I, I think I want to veer away from the athlete-centered terminology because for me it should come back to needs-based. What does that athlete need from me now in this moment? And that can be different for two players on the same team. So for me, I, I like to term it needs-centered approach more than athlete-centered approach. Well, what's exciting about and this Alan, for me, uh, really quickly, is that um, I like how it's a bit conceptual at the moment. And I, I worry that coaches are having a hard time even like you know understanding and, and absorbing. So what's exciting about this conversation is going to be that as we present these ideas on, you know, on how to uh, approach the athlete and and communicate with them. I think, Alan, you're going to actually give us real world examples of how you can then apply those things on the actual court. For me, I'm a, I need to understand what it looks like. So unless you can show me, unless you can bring that to life, that's a waste of time. So what does that look like? What does it mean? Take away the long words. Can you show it? Can you explain it? Can you give me something tangible that I can go away and use right now? And this is where it was breaking down. And for me, if you can't do that, you're wasting your time. So PDS was all about giving people applicational tools. But here's the challenge, and Alan picked up on it. You can't go on a coaching course, however awesome you are. You could be from the Matrix film and you screw something in the back of your head. You can't learn something like that, which is a concept or even practical tools, and then hope you can walk into your practice session and start sharing them, and the players are going to be all over it and thinking this is fantastic, because it will not happen. You're looking about two things. One, you have to change your own behavior once you're aware of it consistently. And the second thing is you need to understand that if a player's behavior needs to change, that is going to take time. So you need to be patient and relentless and give them the tools to do it. Great example, Nick, is so it's not just about picking up some information and running with it. It's about making sure you get the right support as a coach to take you through the journey, but also understand it's going to take a long time with some players to get it to be good enough in the basic skills to be able to apply what you want them to. And if you give up too early, it will just regress. And that's the toughest thing, changing the behavior of the coach to embed it in the players. Mark, can I make a point on that one? Can I jump in if you don't mind, Nick, please? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think as I listen to Mark, and, and he's absolutely hit the nail on the head there with, you know, what it needs to be. But I think the chat, when I look back on my journey, um, my challenge was, and I think what I'm meeting now with a lot of coaches I speak with, um, you're not you're aware you're not aware of what athlete center truly is, and that's not the fault of a coach. I don't believe. I think I got lucky, but I think I on one hand I think I got lucky. On the other hand, I think I created my own luck. And I think on one hand I got lucky because I met you know people like Mark and a performance director and, 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 and read a lot of this stuff and kind of went on a journey myself of trying to educate myself. So there's two sides to it, really, because I, I think it's very easy when you connect with a coach to really unpick. And I had a call this morning, actually, with a bunch of coaches here from the UK and, and overseas, and we talked a little bit about what the, what the, the foundation and fundamental of coaching is. And it peeled itself back to, actually, it's not a relationship with your players. It's a relationship with yourself first. 
And what I mean by that is, how well do you know yourself in, in sports? How well do you know yourself in your own environment? And how well do you know what the value of what you're doing is having on a player? And now we're back to actually what th true athlete centered is. And I guess we'll pick it up later, Mark, in terms of how you audit what you do, because how do you know what you're doing carries value? And I, and I don't want us to come across like we're saying that coaches are not getting it. I just, uh, from my experience, I just don't think coaches have had the right conversation or they've, uh, the ones who are not truly understanding athlete centered or who think they are, they do, but they don't live it. I just don't think they've been privileged enough to have, like my situation, have a connection with Mark or have a connection with somebody else who's actually knows what it truly is and how to bring it to life. It, it kind of sounds like, you know, certainly in America, the way coaches generally run their practices is they're the one voice. And, and they're worried that they don't want any other voices coming in and clouding up the whole basis of the foundation they want to build. So I feel like that's the leap that you got to take to be willing to have other voices actually contribute and raise the bar to what they might learn and maybe learn it even quicker and more efficiently. And I feel like that's that's a big sticking point here for a lot of coaches is that it just seems like uh, they, if they were trying to envision a practice where all of a sudden one of their players starts to like not like necessarily run a drill, but is like actually trying to show people certain things like that would probably be crazy to them. And I wonder if that's those are the kind of hurdles you have to try and get over and get coaches to sort of have a little more uh, faith isn't the right word, but have a little bit more trust that that, that process can work. Yeah, and there, there's two things to that, Nick, is one going back to what Alan said is we need to establish um, accurate self-awareness of coach. So when a coach says, you know, how you coach and how you're interacting, how effective is the interaction? When you shout across to a player across the court in practice, when they're coming in and you're saying, right, you need to do this next time, do that. How are you tracking how effective that is? Not in the next 10 seconds, but the next 40 minutes. And importantly, in the next session without reminding them, has it had a behavioral shift in their learning, understanding and their choices or execution? If it hasn't, it's ineffective. So how are you measuring what you're doing? How do you know what you're doing? One is effective. But in the moment, are you aware of your state? Are you aware how much you're talking? Are you aware it's having an impact as soon as they walk away, what's happening? So there's there's that as a key element. But the, the second point is, is getting coaches to see the value in players thinking and interacting more than they do. Now, here's the challenge. If you don't upskill the players, all you're going to have is players talking for 10 minutes nonsense. And there could be two reasons for that is one, they haven't got the tools and they understand, no, this is short time frame, guys, just on this one success criteria. This is what it means to us. But the second thing is it will highlight that a lot of players don't understand the game management as well as you think. Because for years as a young player, they've been talented in perception of talent is they've been better than the people around them, which, you know, we know that may not be talent. But what they're is they've been really good at following instructions or they've just been faster, stronger, better dribblers, better passers. But actually understanding the game about in this position, there's an open break. I can see it. I can, I can make that choice under pressure. They really struggle because the coach has always told them the answer. So when you step back and go, okay, no situation now. Let's see what you can remember and let's see the choices you make. Based on the coach still selling the framework, this is how we play. All of a sudden, it becomes unraveled. Now the coach is thinking this is a worse session. Well, why do I want to do a worse session, Mark? Because now look at it, it's horrendous. But actually, when you get coaches who understand, no, you're just establishing fact. You stepping away and putting scenarios in and seeing what the players can do without you is establishing what they know, what they understand and what they don't. And then you can delve into, okay, talk to me, Danny. What are the choices over there? To see if actually a player recognized and even saw the choices, and then you can start identifying, okay, this is where the problem is with that player. Let me put an intervention in to deal with that problem. So when you start unraveling it, it's getting the coaches to understand, whoa, I haven't thought about, about it that way before. Yeah, I really need to find out how effective a session is by what's happening with the player's minds and their understanding. Not I've covered the content I wanted to in the time I wanted to, and it looked great. So again, it's understanding what is a successful session? What does that mean? And my opinion is you only know if a session is successful in the following session, when you do what I call a covert recall, it could be two, three sessions time, where without telling the players or talking to them, you throw a scenario in and you check to see how good their learning was from previous sessions without reminder. That's telling you how good previous sessions was. If, it, if you're not doing that, it's all short-term recall. 
And this is why we get so many coaches frustrated with players continually making the same mistakes in a game. And the coach is thinking, we went over that 100 times in practice. Well, the problem is the coach was doing all the thinking. Now the players are having to do the thinking in the game. So we need to understand what is the purpose of practice. Can, can I, before we move on from the athlete versus need centered approach, can I share something with you guys, please? Sure. Um, uh, you know, the federation here about a year ago asked me to deliver a, a coaching clinic to our domestic coaches. And it was just after the European Championships. And um, they didn't give me a specific topic. They said, look, go in whatever direction you want to go with it. So I thought, okay, well, let me, let me call up some players I've coached on the national team in the past. Um, the current and the past. So, for example, I, I spoke to a couple of players who are playing overseas professional in Europe right now in their mid-20s. I called up an ex-GB uh, international who played in the Olympics, um, who is retired now. And I also spoke to a couple of my current national team players. And my simple question to all of them was, what do you look for in a coach? What, does, what characteristics and traits do you look for in a coach that gets the best out of you? And if I just give you the summary of the common trends, I think it, it, for me, the, the player is never wrong because, you know, they know what they know, what, where they are in their journey and, and we're part of that journey. And I, and I, as a coach, want to grow with them on that journey. So this collaborative approach for me stands is very important. But what backs up that, that mindset and what backs up that need-centered approach for me was the common trend where they all said they wanted honest coaches who trusted their players. And they were looking for a coach who would let them problem solve. Um, now, some of these players, most of these players I had coached for a period of time in the summer with the national team. There was a few I hadn't coached and, one, and they were older. So one was retired, the other one was nearing retirement. And I hadn't had any impact on that, but they were more mature. Um, and the other things they said is they want a coach who, who relinquishes control and accepts ideas from the player, um, invest time in the person, not just the player, um, patience, emotional control, uh, somebody who will develop a player coach relationship, no dictators who came up a lot um, and help them to grow as people as well as athletes. And then the last one that really like t blew me away and I thought, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it just affirms for me I'm in the right direction. They were, a couple of them mentioned, not all of them, a couple of them mentioned, we want a coach who has a desire to evolve and get better. Now, that's not the words they use, but that's, I'm summarizing it for you guys. They want a coach who's going to go on a, a learning journey with them. And I thought that was really, um, really affirming for me that this is... Uh, the best way to go to approach my coaching. And I think it very much ties in with the need-centered approach. If, if I can jump in here, because I feel like when I deal with a lot of coaches, and I, I was the coach that you would have had to have, you know, just slap in the face five times and said, what are you doing, man? So uh, was I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because of the, my age, that's all I learned growing up was that model, the Bobby Knight style. But, yeah. um, you know, I think what, what is interesting is what, what gets coaches frustrated is that they don't, there's no buy-in, right? That player is not buying into my system. And I feel like what you just said, Alan, about how the players need to have the – they want to know that the coaches want to evolve. I think that whatever trust a coach needs to have in the player that they're going to do what they want them to do on the court, it's the same way on the other side. The players need to trust that the coach wants to get the best out of them. And if you can, if you get that trust from the player, then you'll get all the buy-in that you're talking about. But I feel like there's that resistance from coaches who think it's only one way, and all I, it, all your job as a player is is to earn my trust, and it's not. It's the actually, it has to be somewhat equal or completely equal or the other way, where you need to get the player's trust. And again, that's a really interesting term. It might take a while to assimilate in your brain, but I can tell you right now is when you start to to demonstrate. Uh, it tangibly that you want these guys to get better, you know, and that's if, if that's jumping into drills or working on their shooting with them uh, and, and offering uh, those kind of things. Those are the moments where you realize that's when they start to believe that you want to help them and then they start to listen to you more. Um, and I feel like that's, that's a major turning point in a lot of coaches' uh, evolutions. 
So there you have it, sports fans. If you have any questions about episode one, put them in the comments and I'll make sure to answer them below. But also, don't forget, every Thursday we'll be dropping a new episode for the next three weeks after today. And then on May 8th, we'll have a live Q&A, 11 a.m. Pacific. So make sure you can tune into that. But it'll also be live after that on my YouTube channel. So don't forget, really try to absorb this. When we get back on the court and you're working with your teams, I think you're going to notice even just a little bit of uh, attempt to try what they're talking about opens up a whole pan. Pandora's box of a new way to communicate, and I'm telling you, the players that you coach will respond. So, we'll see you next week on episode two, and don't forget at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You in?